Hello and welcome to the talk on transfers of undertakings. My name is Declan O'Dempsey and I've developed these slides in conjunction with Chris Milsom of Cloisters. We're going to talk about the regulations of 2014 and see these against the background of the European Union law. I want to talk primarily about the new rules that have been introduced under the Collective Redundancies and Transfer of Undertakings Protection of Employment Amendment Regulations of 2014. These introduce changes to the Collective Redundancy Rules under Section 198A of the Trade Union and Labour Relations Consolidation Act 1992. They also introduce some important changes to the Transfer of Undertakings Protection of Employment Regulations of 2006, known as the TUPI Regulations. We'll also be viewing these changes against the background of the Business Transfers Directive under European Union law, that's Directive 2001-23 EC. Under the regulations, there are two types of business change that are covered as transfers of an undertaking. There is the situation where a transfer of a business or undertaking or part of a business takes place. There is, that occurs where there's a transfer of an economic entity which retains its identity The second type is a service provision change, and this occurs where an entity has engaged a contractor to do work on its behalf, and then there's a reassigning of the contract or uh, where the work is brought in-house. So standard type of transfers are dealt with under Regulation 31A of TUPI, and the service provision change is 31B. Turning to the standard transfer of an undertaking, what you need is the transfer of an undertaking, business or part of an undertaking or business, situated immediately before the transfer in the UK to another person. There must be the transfer of an economic entity which re retains its identity. So we'll have to look at the concept of an economic entity. There has to be a transfer of that economic entity and the economic entity has to retain its identity after the transfer. So what is an economic entity? Regulation 3.2 tells us that it's an organised grouping of resources which has the objective of pursuing an economic activity, whether or not that activity is central or ancillary. So essentially, it's a test of the structure and the purpose of those resources. And the objective must be to pursue an economic activity. Resources in this context means tangible and intangible assets, but it also includes employees. And this is partly why a service provision change can also constitute a transfer of an undertaking. It isn't significant whether property is transferred to the transferee by the transferor as a result of Regulation 3.6b of the TUPI regulations. Merely having a collection of assets which goes from one to the other is insufficient. There has to be this purpose of pursuing an economic activity and there has to be organisation in order to achieve that purpose at the heart of the collection of assets. A stable economic entity is not necessarily a financially viable one, but it has to be an ongoing economic enterprise. 
In the service sector, an organised grouping of wage earners, specifically and permanently assigned to a common task, can constitute this type of collection of assets. So what about parts of an undertaking? Well, there can be a transfer of an undertaking where there is transfer of part of an undertaking. If an entity as a whole transfers to several new operators, uh, each of which only operates part of the previous operation, this, it's still possible to have a transfer of an undertaking, as the Fairhurst case demonstrates. It's not necessary, therefore, for there to be an identifiable economic entity before the transfer. You have, of course, to ask the question whether there is an identifiable economic entity. And relevant to that question is the degree of fragmentation. You might have a degree of fragmentation that is so great that what comes out of the transfer uh, is not recognisably the same entity or part of an entity uh, when viewed as a whole. Or there may be circumstances uh, in which uh, an individual separated part, or even all of the separated parts, were not of themselves stable uh, economic entities within that definition we looked at earlier. Even if there isn't a stable economic entity before the transfer, it is possible for a stable economic entity to emerge at the time of the transfer. So it, it's necessary when considering a transfer of part of an undertaking to consider whether a stable economic entity emerges from the way in which the <clears throat> entity has been parceled out uh, or the uh, structure. Well, what's important is the purpose rather than the packaging. Regulation 3.4b of TUP makes it clear that it applies to a transfer, however that is affected. So it could be a series of transfers, um, it could be a disposal other than by way of commercial sale. That doesn't matter. What you have to look at is the substance. Well, what does matter is the identity and whether you can identify the uh, economic entity after the transfer. So what are the kinds of uh, factors that you would look at? You would, you would look to see whether there's been transfer of tangible assets. You would look at the intangible assets and their value at the time of the transfer. You'd look at the transfer of goodwill in a business and you would look at the fate of the majority of the employees, the fate of the customers, the degree of similarity between activities before and after the transfer. You'd look at any period during which the activities which were being undertaken before the transfer are suspended or disrupted. And finally, you'd look at the transferees' use of the employees. Now, clearly, the question of whether the activities before and after are sufficiently similar is going to be one of fact for the initial tribunal. What that means is it will be often difficult to appeal against a finding of a tribunal concerning whether or not the activities were sufficiently similar or sufficiently dissimilar for there to have been or not to have been a transfer of an undertaking. Turning next to the definition of a service provision change, this occurs where activities cease to be carried out by a person known as the client on his own behalf and are carried out instead by another person on the client's behalf, the contractor. So when activities cease to be carried out by a contractor on a client's behalf, 
uh, whether or not those activities had previously been carried on, out by the client on its own behalf, and where those activities are carried out instead by another person, call them the subsequent contractor, again on the client's behalf, or where activities cease to be carried out by a contractor or a subsequent contractor on a client's behalf, whether or not those activities had previously been carried out by the client on his own behalf, and are carried out instead by the client on the client's own behalf, then if certain conditions are satisfied, which are set out in subparagraph 3, then there will have been a transfer of the undertaking, a service provision change. Now, after 2014 and the most recent changes, where there's a reference to activities in this context, it means activities which are fundamentally the same as the activities carried out by the person who has ceased to carry them out. Now, this was the effect of the case law on the 2006 regulations, but now under the 2014 amendments, this has been made completely clear and explicit by Regulation 3 2 capital A. So we can see then that references to activities being carried out instead by another person, including the client, are references to activities which are fundamentally the same as the activities carried out by the person who has ceased to carry them out. And this applies to transfers on or after the 31st of January 2014. But it was also the effect of the previous case law. Under Regulation 3.5 of TUPE, an administrative reorganisation of public administrative authorities or the transfer of administrative functions between public administrative authorities is not a relevant transfer. So the concept of a public administrative authority is not coextensive with the concept of public bodies. In the case of the Adult Learning Inspectorate in Belloff, it was said that it's a body whose functions involve the exercise of public authority. So a body whose functions involve the exercise of a public authority um, may be a public administrative authority. So, for example, the Law Society Complaints Body, although a private law body, was a public administrative authority. That was determined in the Law Society and Secretary of State for Justice and Office for Legal Complaints. However, by uh, Regulation uh, 3 uh, 4, uh, non profit organisations are uh, included under the regulations. Regulation 4 deals with the effect of a tr relevant transfer on the contract of uh, employment. It's worth noting, however, that the transfer can take place by one or a series of transactions. There's no requirement that the series of transactions should be close to each other in time. So it appears therefore that however an undertaking is disposed of, even if it involves a series of transfers, there may be a transfer of an undertaking. And the actual change of employer responsible for running the economic uh, unit is indicative of a de facto transfer of a business or a part of it. There isn't even a requirement for a 
formal document to be signed. Um, and you can find that in the Daybell and Vale Industrial Services Nottingham Limited case. So what's the effect of a transfer? If there's been a relevant transfer, the transfer does not terminate the contract of anyone employed by the transferor who was assigned to the organised grouping of resources or employees that has been subject to the relevant transfer where that contract would otherwise be terminated by the transfer. Now, without the transfer of undertakings regulations, the effect of a transfer of the business is generally to terminate the contract of employment. However, where the transfer of undertakings regulations apply, the contract of employment has effect after the transfer as if it was originally made between the transferee and the person who's been transferred. However, under the 2014 uh, transfer regulations, there's been a slight alteration to the way in which variations of contract can take place. For transfers taking place on or after the 31st of January 2014, the purported variation of a contract of employment uh, transferred is void if the sole or principal reason for the variation uh, is the transfer. Now, this is a change from the 2006 regulations, which also included variations where the reason for the variation is connected to the transfer. So this new version of the transfer regulations allows employers to purport to vary the contract of employment um, with greater ease. Even if the sole or principal reason for the variation of the contract is the transfer of the undertaking, it's possible to have variations of the a contract if the sole or principal reason for it is an economic, technical or organisational reason entailing changes in the workforce, provided that the employer and employee agree the variation uh, or the uh, terms of the contract permit the employer to make such a variation. So where a, an agreed or permitted variation of a term incorporated uh, from a collective agreement takes effect on a date more than one year after the date of the transfer, it is permissible to cite as the reason or principal reason for that variation, the transfer itself. So the regulations state that the effect, the voiding effect of regulation 3.4 doesn't apply in respect of a variation of contract of employment in so far as it varies a term or condition incorporated uh, from a collective agreement, provided that the variation of the contract takes effect on a date more than one year after the date of the transfer, and following that variation, the rights and obligations in the employee's contract, when considered together, are no less favourable to the employee than those which applied immediately before the variation. Also, these rules 
don't affect any rule of law as to whether a contract of employment is effectively varied. So, when it comes to the question of the of whether the rights are no less favourable to the employee, how is the Employment Tribunal going to analyse this? Do they have to look at how the terms were originally valued? What compromises were reached? What the terms mean to the particular employee? How are they going to reach a view on the rights and obligations being no less favourable? Difficult issues of discrimination may arise uh, in this context because it may well be that a particular term is reasonably valued for certain of its effects. Will the tribunal have to take into account how that term is reasonably valued and look at the overall uh, favourability or otherwise of the package of rights within that context. I think a tribunal will look at this question in more than simply financial terms because the contract of employment goes to many other aspects of the regulation of em relations between employer and employee. So there are a series of uh, questions about variation in this context, there has to be incorporation from a collective agreement. So it may be necessary to go back and have a look at the at rules about incorporation of collective terms. Secondly, the variation must take effect uh, on a date more than one year after the date of the transfer. That may give rise to questions uh, about uh, when the variation uh, takes effect uh, if it relates uh, to uh, rights which are being accrued uh, during the year, for example. We've dealt with the question of whether the employment tribunal has to look at how the terms are originally valued and the difference between the term-by-term -term comparison that takes place in some discrimination contexts, such as equal pay, and this concept of considering the rights and obligations of the employee taken together. Is it a subjective or objective test? You take account of the circumstances of the employee and make an objective evaluation, perhaps. Do you simply make an objective evaluation? Well, there's a danger in the latter case of failing to recognise the discriminatory impact of a variation. On the other hand, if you make the test purely subjective, uh, is it going to be workable? How is an employer going to be able to proceed with any confidence if the question of whether the whole package is less favourable or no less favourable is going to be one of the subjectivity of the employee. My own view is that the first of these options, taking account of the circumstances of the employee and their views and making an objective evaluation, will be uh, the way in which a uh, tribunal will have to approach this. By Rule 4a, which is a new provision under the uh, 2014 regulations. If a contract which has been transferred incorporates provisions of collective agreement, as may be uh, agreed from time to time, Regulation 4.2 uh, doesn't transfer any rights, powers, duties and liabilities in relation to any provision of a collective agreement if the following conditions are met. The provision of the collective agreement is agreed after the date of the transfer. 
So for example, you might have a pay increase negotiated between Transferor and the trade union, and the agreement is reached after the date of the transfer. And the transferee, the new employer, this is the second requirement, uh, is not a participant in the collective bargaining for that provision. So the new employer hasn't agreed with the union that there should be a pay increase. Now, in those circumstances where those conditions are satisfied, the contract of employment of the individual has effect after the transfer, as if it doesn't incorporate the provisions of the collective agreement uh, which satisfy uh, those conditions. So in other words, it doesn't incorporate anything agreed after the transfer where the transferee wasn't a participant in the collective bargaining for that uh, provision. What this may envisage, of course, is that the transferee is a participant in the collective bargaining, but didn't agree to the particular provision. In other words, you could have a situation in which both transferor and transferee engage in negotiation with the same union over pay. And they are part of the same collective bargaining process, but one does and the other doesn't agree to the pay increase. In those circumstances, which are going to be rather narrow, perhaps confined to certain health service scenarios, the transferee uh, may be bound by the agreement that's reached after the date of the transfer. Now that's a slightly odd result, but it does seem to be the effect of the condition being not that the transferee has agreed to the provision as a result of collective bargaining, but that the transferee simply was a participant in the collective bargaining for that provision. However, as I say, the circumstances in which this will arise um, are going to be limited. The other effect, of course, of this provision is that those collective agreement terms which are incorporated prior to the transfer uh, will take effect. One of the changes that's been introduced by the 2014 regulations is uh, losing the looser test of uh, when a um, reason is a permissible reason or not a permissible reason. It, this occurs in the phrase for a reason connected with the transfer. So both in relation to variations of terms and conditions and in relation to dismissals, the test now is whether the reason for the variation or the reason for the dismissal is the sole or principal reason. So the sole or principal reason for, for example, a variation must be more than a reason which is simply connected with the transfer. Now, this will lead to disputes over whether something is a princi the principal reason for the variation or dismissal. And it's going to be a matter of degree. I think it'll amount to the question of what is the key reason for the variation. It's possible to draw an analogy with the dismissal uh, cases, obviously the same uh, phrase of reason or principal reason um, is uh, used, or sole or principal reason uh, is used. So for example, um, 
Mr Justice Elias, as he was then sitting in the Employment Appeal Tribunal in the Aslef and Brady case, uh, suggests that it's possible to draw an analogy um, concerning burden of proof and um, how a principal reason is detected. Now that was a case concerning the principal reason for dismissal. By analogy with what's said there, under Regulation 5A, the burden of uh, proof at uh, once the employee submits evidence that the variation was caused by the transfer is on the employer to show that the principal reason was an economic, technical or organisational reason entailing changes in the workforce. So where there's evidence that there was a set of mixed reasons, the principal reason may be a non-ETO reason, despite the fact that the economic, technical or organisational reason entailing changes in the workforce would have justified the variation if it had been the principal reason. You could also have, the, have a look at the East Lancashire coach builders case. In the context of redundancy, the older case of Timex Corporation and Thompson may assist. The apparent existence of one reason may disguise the true reason for a dismissal. Thus they said there, uh, even where there's a redundancy situation, it's possible for an employer to use such a situation as a pretext for getting rid of an employee who wishes who it wishes to dismiss. In such circumstances, the reason for dismissal will not necessarily be the redundancy. It's for the, as it was then, industrial tribunal in each case to see whether on all the evidence the employer has shown them what was so turning then to the dismissal of an employee after transfer, the rule after 31st of January 2014 is that where either before or after a relevant transfer, any employee of the transferor or transferee is dismissed, the employee is to be treated as unfairly dismissed if the sole or principal reason for the dismissal is the transfer. Before 2014, you would also be able to argue that the employee would be unfairly dismissed if the reason was a reason connected with the transfer. In this context, it's worth looking at Article 4 of the Directive, which says that the transfer of the undertaking, business or part of the undertaking or business, shall not in itself constitute grounds for dismissal by the transferor or transferee. This provision shall not stand in the way of dismissals that may take place for economic, technical or organisational reasons entailing changes in the workforce. Now that has to be given some meaning, I'd suggest. And in trying to give it uh, some meaning, it occurs uh, to me that the question of whether the transfer of its in itself constitutes grounds for dismissal allows for a broader construction of grounds than the phrase that's used in the domestic law. It's also significant that the directive felt it necessary to uh, put in that the provision would not stand in the way of dismissals that may take place for economic, technical or organisational reasons entailing changes in the workforce. Now, of course, if grounds and reasons were the same thing, then the latter phrase uh, would um, not be uh, needed if a narrow concept of grounds was being adopted. So if you would avoid the effect of Article 4, where you had some reason 
which was not the transfer of the business itself as the reason for dismissal, um, then it wouldn't be necessary to state that uh, reasons uh, which are economic, technical or organisational reasons entailing changes in the workforce, which may be other than the transfer itself, uh, are not prohibited. Under the 2014 uh, rules, if the sole or principal reason for the dismissal is an ETO, which entails changes in the workforce of either the transferor or transferee, before or after a relevant transfer, then the dismissal isn't automatically unfair under Regulation 4, and you apply ordinary unfair dismissal principles. The reason for dismissal is a, some other substantial reason, such as to justify the dismissal of an employee holding the position which that employee held, or uh, its redundancy if the definition of redundancy is satisfied. Under Regulation 9, which apply in insolvency situations, there has been a, a change the transferor, if the transferor is subject to relevant insolvency proceedings, and the transfer is the sole or principal reason for the variation, and there's not an ETO reason entailing changes in the workforce, then the variation is a permitted variation. So this means that in insolvency situations, it's possible for a variation of the terms to take place, even if that variation does not take place for an economic, technical or organisational reason, which entails changes in the workforce. Finally, the regulations deal with the duty to inform and consult. Some of these uh, provisions are inserted into the Trade Union Relations uh, and Labour Relations Consolidation Act. But one of the changes is to exempt or to change the way in which uh, micro businesses conduct the duty to inform and consult the employees. So a micro business, so that's a, an employer who employs fewer than 10 employees, and the burden is on the employer to show that at the relevant time it employed fewer than 10 employees. Where there are no appropriate representatives and the employer hasn't invited the employees to elect employee representatives, the employer can comply with the consultation and information duties under Regulation 13 by performing those duties relating to appropriate representatives as if the employees were appropriate representatives. Now, the employer has to prove that all of those provisions apply, but in other words, in a really small business, uh, you don't have to go to the bother of electing uh, uh, employee representatives if you're prepared to uh, consult and inform the workforce as a whole.